May I speak in the name of the holy and undivided Trinity who is eternal majesty, incarnate word and abiding Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Please be seated. Friends, Easter season 2024 is behind us. The Feast of Pentecost 2024 behind us. Trinity Sunday 2024 behind us. We come at last to the long period designated as after Pentecost. <laughs> Traditionally, the church also calls it ordinary time, which prompts me to ask, how do you ordinarily relate to time? What do you do with it? What is time doing with you or to you? <laughs> of course, these are questions about life itself, how we live it and how we relate to the Holy One who gives it to us. Today, with this beginning of ordinary time again, we have returned to the Gospel according to Mark, where it is written, Then Jesus said to his critics, The Sabbath was made for humankind and not humankind for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Now in Mark, we're only in chapter two, and Jesus has already done a lot. But now there appears already in this story some of his severest critics, Pharisees. Before the reading is over, these people are already plotting to do away with him. Now, before going any further, let us not confuse those Pharisees with the whole of Judaism as a religion. And still less should we conflate them with Jewishness as an ethnicity, thereby lapsing into anti-Semitic thinking. Because I tell you, sadly, some Christians have done just that over the centuries. The Pharisees were actually the nice people. They were a religious party, a social movement, a school of thought. The scholars still debate the degree to which the Pharisees who were Jesus's critics and adversaries really represented their movement as a whole. By Jesus's time, Pharisees as a religious party had gradually secured a large following among the common people who admired their austerity. They exerted influence through the development of education and fostered synagogue worship. In short, they were seriously religious people a fact that ought to make at least clergy stop and think. <laughs> In the Gospels, Pharisees attacked Jesus for forgiving sins, breaking the Sabbath, and consorting with sinners. Doubtless, they had their theological justifications for their opposition. In today's gospel, the issue is how to interpret the fourth commandment, to keep holy the Sabbath. To expand on that, I cannot do better than share what our own Bishop Craig Loya said in his most recent weekly message to Minnesota clergy. He wrote, 
This Sunday's gospel involves a dispute between Jesus and other religious leaders about how best to keep the commandments to honor the Sabbath. There are a few things worth noting about this exchange. The first is that Sabbath is an actual commandment. It's not a suggestion, a luxury, or an indulgence. It's on the same level as not committing murder. So whenever I or anyone else lets that practice go, it's not just ill-advised, it's a symptom of our sinful nature. Keeping the practice, which is actually really hard, is a way of staying open to God's redeeming work in me. Our bishop continues. Second, the commandment to keep Sabbath is not just because God wanted everyone to go to synagogue or church one day a week, or that God likes to impose random rules to interrupt our lives. The Ten Commandments are given to Israel as they are being freed from slavery in Egypt, and they are a code for God's economic of liberation over and against Pharaoh's economics of oppression. Pharaoh says, work because humans are worth what they produce. God says, rest because human worth comes from the divine image they bear. Those are the words of our bishop. Jesus, in his words and actions, was not rejecting the idea of Sabbath, but rather I think he was challenging a certain kind of religious mindset that added to the fourth commandment a collection of rules that became an, in, an end in themselves. Such a mindset makes one prone to, the saying goes, lose the plot. That is, makes us prone to forgetting the point of the original commandment. What at least some Pharisees did with Sabbath law, some Christians have also done and still do. There is a surprisingly long history of movements to specify in minute detail what you cannot do on the Sabbath. Happily, we don't experience much of that in the Episcopal Church. <laughs> Judaism itself made room for responding to need even on the Sabbath. Jesus' critics with that mindset did not. The kind of religion that angered Jesus seemed to be all about following rules. And there are Christians who still give that impression. Worse, there are those who in the name of Christ would force their rules on everyone else no matter the human cost. I wonder if that kind of religion finds its chief adherents among those who by temperament, upbringing, or circumstances have become good at following rules. I was still a child well, I'm confessing to you now, I was still a child when I realized I was good at keeping the rules. <laughs> I was much more adept than my little brother. <laughs> and I valued the approval that came with that from my parents, and teachers, and the other adults around me. Then too, there are people who are afraid that if they do not follow all the rules, they will be found wanting, rejected, shut out, 
unloved. By the way, I don't think those two groups of people are necessarily mutually exclusive. The Pharisaic mindset in any religion seeks not a trusting relationship with God, but to be in a position of control. As if one can say, I obey all the rules and therefore God has got to give me what I want. There's no room in that for grace. And also, when you get right down to it, little room for real loving of one's neighbor. In contrast, Jesus did not reject the fourth commandment, but he retained his authority to put rules in proper perspective and to respond to human need first. So perhaps today we are being called to look for the Pharisees' error not only within their approach to religion, but in our own tradition, and especially within ourselves. To try to do a little less channeling of our inner Pharisee. Surely, to worthily observe Sabbath time calls for worshiping God and for taking time for rest and recreation. Regular Sabbath time lets us breathe and look at how we relate to time. Stopping work and taking time to worship and rest at least one day a week lets us notice whether or not we are really alive to life as blessing, including the blessings of community and communion with God and each other. The commandments, the true commandments of God are all for the sake of holy love. And so, too, is Jesus' approach to the Sabbath. The Pharisees of Jesus' day were his critics, his adversaries, but they were the same people for whom he was willing to die so that they might know themselves set free from their fear, from their isolation, from their indifference to the blessings of community and indifference to the needs of others. To keep Sabbath is to step back from ordinary labor and recall that we are more than the work we do. Certainly we are more than instruments for someone else's profit. Above all, honoring the call to take regular Sabbath time is to remember that the most important work is not ours, but God's. So, dear friends, let us honor the gift of Sabbath and the God who knows our need for rest and recreation. <laughs>